So there's mechanics and then there's concepts. And what I've seen over the course of my career, I'm almost two decades in this in these accounting streets. But what I've seen is that there are a lot of misunderstandings when it comes to concepts versus mechanics. So as an example, if you think about your job and what you do and any processes, I say any processes because it's a lot of companies that have not documented their processes, or if they have, they haven't done it in a way that's effective. So if you see an SOP about how to do something and the whole SOP is just about go into this system, run this report, input these dates, use this date format, download it, convert it to Excel, do text to columns, do this, this, and this, save the file, do this, add this number because this person wants to see this. Then you have to manually pull in this and then you save the file as this date format. So we know that it's the current month and then you have to email the file every month by the 15th to these people. Okay. Got it. But what is this report again? What's the purpose of it? What am I doing this for? Who are the stakeholders? How, how is this affecting any kind of change or impact in the financial statements? What's the end goal for this particular task? What systems are used? What, what files or what access do I need? How often does this need to be done? How does this tie into the larger goals of what we're trying to do here? All of that is usually lacking in process documentation. And I love how a lot of what I talk to my CPA exam students about is applicable in real life. And that's how I approach preparing candidates for the exam to say, if you really don't understand the equity method versus consolidations versus the acquisition method, let's look at a real situation. Let's look at how this would play out in real life in in a headline that you see on CNBC or a real transaction that's happening at a company because they're trying to understand the mechanics. If a company is going to acquire another company, okay, you have to look at this, this, and this, and then you have to do this. And they're trying to memorize these steps, but it's like, just take a step back and think about what's happening. A mom and pop is acquiring a smaller company and now they need to figure out X, Y, and Z. So conceptually, once it makes sense, the mechanics are what follow. But the disconnect is a lot of organizations, large and small, public and private, lead with the mechanics. And then because mechanics are subjective, there's more than one way to do something, right? You find yourself being trained to think that the mechanics are the gospel and that this is the way that it's supposed to be done. Even though you don't really understand why you're doing what you're doing, you don't understand, you don't really know for certain whether you're adding value or not, right? This is just one of those things that when you started this job, your predecessor who had already put in, they know this, and now you partnered up with them until they last day so you could learn everything that they learned. They're showing you how to do it the way that they did it. So you're new. You want to make a good impression. You don't want to ruffle any feathers. So you follow those instructions from your predecessor to a T. Might not be the best way. You might have a better way of doing it. It probably makes no sense at all. Or you probably sitting here like, is this even relevant? Because her predecessor handed it to her, who handed it to her, who handed it to her. And now she's giving it to me. When is the last time this process has been re-engineered? When is the last time somebody took a step back and said, wait, is this really the best way to do this? 
Or how can I make this better? And that's that's what I see a lot of. I've been one of those people. I have done it before. It's it's that fall in line syndrome as a new person or somebody who's afraid to to come to the table with ideas for fear of being shot down or fear of being wrong. And it's okay to be wrong because when you're wrong to me, that means that you're trying. And if you know that that's wrong, okay, not quite, but go back to the drawing board and let's look at it a different way. And that's how you learn by using your brain, by doing your job. And I tell my team all the time, like, look, Don't be afraid to do your job. You know what I'm saying? If something doesn't make sense, ask a question. If you are wondering why you're doing this report every single month and you email it to somebody, what happens after that? Or if you want to make sure that you have the right inputs so that when you do send off this report, the people that you're sending it to can have confidence in what you've provided to them. Because they're probably going to speak to their superiors about that. And they're going to make company-wide decisions based on the information that you're providing. You should have confidence in that. You should be well-versed in your job. Just like I said, or just like I say, every week on LinkedIn, when I get that message from somebody looking for career advice who say, how do I make sure my work gets noticed? How do I move up within the company? And every time there's a number of things you can do in response to that question. But the number one thing is do your job and do it well in a way that nobody else can do it better than you. That's that's the bottom line. You really can't skirt around the work. On the CPA exam in life, period. And when people are saying I've been watching this lecture or I've been reading this chapter and now I feel like I don't know anything. It's because you're following the mechanics of what that instructor is saying, because you're trying to learn verbatim what's coming out of their mouth or the words on that page, because you feel like when you sit in front of that exam, those are the exact same words in the exact same order that you're going to see. And the reality is that All that tells me is that you are making mediocre effort and that you are not trying hard enough. You are trying, you're spending so much time and energy data gathering, trying to figure out what was on somebody else's exam. How much do you need to know about leases as opposed to saying, okay, leases might be a heavily tested topic on the exam. Let me dive in and understand the ins and outs and what some of the nuances are that that can be tripping people up on the exam. Or let me really talk through the the concepts of a bond and when it's issued at a discount versus a premium. And if I'm paying less for something, it's kind of like it being on sale. And so you can easily take a bond explanation and turn it into buying something, buying clothes on sale versus full price or going out here and buying a car and what that amortization schedule is going to look like if you want to pay it off. It's so many different ways to figure out the the content and not really overcomplicate it, but the complications are coming from people looking for the easy way out. I saw a question the other day (laughs) in one of these CPA exam groups, and it just, it blew me back. The question said, should I wait until, and this is a forum, like CPA candidates ask stuff here all the time. And occasionally I chime in as a 13 time test taker to give them some insight, some advice, some different way of looking at the exam. And this question was, should I wait until the first quarter to take my harder exams like FAR, which I'll touch on FAR being the harder exam in a second. But since I should I wait until the first quarter to take my harder exams 
exams like FAR because I heard that the CPA exams are easier in the first quarter because it's busy season. And I'm like, where in the entire fuck did that come from? The CPA exam has no mercy on nobody. Oh, it's busy season. Oh, it's tax season. We're going to do, we're going to make all the easy exams in January, February, March. I would not even have given that. <laughs> Hearing somebody say that, I couldn't give any life to that. That does not make cat sense. Nobody cares about your day job, about your responsibilities at home, about how many kids you have, about how many hours you work in, about when you want to go on vacation versus when you can sit for your exam. NASBA, the AICPA, they give no zero fucks about that. And the fact that this candidate spent so much time trying to figure this out posting it in this open forum and that is really jogging her brain right now is like you're taking up time effort energy that you can be studying that you can be learning the concepts and so if that was the case if somebody on there I was so disgusted I couldn't even hang around for the comments but I'm sure somebody on there attested pun intended, somebody on that post attested to what she said. And based on that, she's probably going to make a wrong decision thinking that she can take far at the first of the year because it's going to be easier because it's busy season. And she is going to lower her studying standards because she's thinking that far is going to be easy. And another thing that people have allowed themselves to be consumed with is thinking that things like FAR is the hard exam or BEC is the easy exam. Y'all see this stuff online. I don't know where they come from. Maybe somebody said it to you, but don't believe that. Don't fall for that. The only reason I can say that FAR was not as difficult as I expected it to be because I went into my CPA exam journey expecting the absolute worst. I went in there as if I knew nothing. And I had years, at least 10 years, 10, 11 years of on the job experience. So those of you who are studying and working in accounting in a FAR audit reg or BEC capacity, you have firsthand knowledge. You probably know if you if you've done taxes for a long time, you already know a lot of the the red content. But the way that it's presented to you, the intimidating way that it's presented to you with these these books that look like phone books and these hours of lectures and all the MCQs and the simulations, you 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 intimidate it. Now you feel like you don't know. It's like you've done taxes for five, six, seven years. You know. How much is, let's see, five, I think reg has five areas and three of them are tax. So a lot of that you probably already know. We allow our minds, our mindsets to be shifted and we fall into this trap of trying to overanalyze what is going to be tested on the exam versus actually preparing to take the exam. And... Then people come in the in the groups and they say, I just took FAR. I just took audit and I feel like I failed. Well, if you feel like that, you probably did. And that speaks to you knowing that you didn't put forth your best effort. Now, I've had I took FAR on a whim one time when I first passed FAR. I had my credit, it expired, and then I had credit for all the other ones. And so I tried to wing it. It was one of those situations like, okay, my scores are going to start expiring in a month if I don't get credit for this exam. So I winged FAR. I went and took FAR and I hadn't studied in over a year. I hadn't seen the content in over a year because I was taking all the other sections. And 
I winged it because I said, I've, I've seen the content. I've taken it before. Maybe I can scoot by enough to get a 75 and be done with the CPA exam. So let me see. Let me roll the dice. Let me see. I got a 59. And I was like, oh, my God, that is terrible. That is embarrassing. I can't even believe that. But then I see people in these message boards like I studied for three months and I got a 60. And I'm like, OK, something wasn't right because I know something wasn't right with my strategy. So we have to get to the point where. We are crystal clear on the distinction between understanding mechanics and understanding concepts. Because when you understand the concept of leases, of bond accounting, of accrual versus cash basis accounting, you can answer the question whether they give it to you in a multiple choice question, in a simulation, in a document review, in a written communication. It don't matter how it's delivered. If, if you're given a question that you've studied and you can, you can repeat it and you can speak intelligently about it, you got it. Let's just not lose sight of what we're doing. The CPA exam is just the practice, because once you pass, don't forget you have a job to go to or you have a company to start or you have other CPAs to help out. And you actually need to know this stuff. Now companies are paying you. Now clients are paying you to know this stuff that you've been studying all this time. So don't cheat yourself and try to skate through the CPA exam. Just to be done like I was just because I want my license. I want to get it as quickly as possible. Spend time in that journey because you will learn a lot about yourself and what you want to do with your career. Because being a CPA exam coach was nowhere remotely on my agenda. And when I saw the need. And when I saw how me sharing my struggles helped everybody else, I'm like, oh, there's a need here. A need I didn't know existed. I thought it was only unique to me as a busy mom with a demanding job trying to get this license. But stop cheating yourself and being okay with mediocre, being okay with getting a 75. Push for that 99. Because when your mind tells you that you want to get a 99... Your actions will follow that 99 mindset. You'll work a little harder. You'll do a few more practice questions. You'll ask yourself a few more logical questions. So this was totally off the dome. It, it was really just bothering me. I had no show notes whatsoever. I actually just got out of the seat from my day job and I was just coming to take a breather, but it was on my mind and I'm like, damn, I need to, I need to record a podcast real quick. So I I can't even call this a bonus episode because this is just so prevalent right now. And y'all are missing the mark and making the exam harder than it is because you think you're not as smart as you really are. You're not looking at the big picture and you skate and buy and you think it's okay. And it's not do better y'all excellence all the time. I love y'all. Talk to y'all later.